Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Jack Douglas. The city of Philadelphia is one of the few major cities in America older than the nation's independence, yet as up to date as tomorrow's skyscrapers. Now, travel agents call Philadelphia a package deal, meaning it offers the visitor just about everything from history to hijinks. So if you haven't decided where you'd like to spend your next vacation, tonight's armchair nomination is the two Philadelphia. This is the skyline of Philadelphia. In population, the fourth largest city in the United States and the cradle of American independence. Now, if you haven't been to Philadelphia in the past five years, you're bound to notice a lot of changes, for the city is engaged in a long program of rebuilding and restoration. Some 200 years ago, Philadelphia looked like this, as Benjamin Franklin, its most famous citizen, knew it and loved it. William Penn, the great Quaker, founded Philadelphia in 1682, after first concluding his historic treaty with the Indians that established the Providence of Pennsylvania. The plot of ground on which the treaty was made is marked by a small obelisk, and the last two words are unbroken faith. Independence Hall is easily recognizable even by tens of millions who have never been to Philadelphia. And inside the hall, more than a million hands each year reach out to touch the world's most famous bell, of course, the Liberty Bell. Cast in England in 1752, it cracked the first time it was rung in Philadelphia that same year. It was recast in the city by Pass and Stowe and served well for many years, ringing out the Declaration of Independence on July 4, 1776. It cracked and was used for the last time in 1835 when it told for the funeral of Chief Justice John Marshall. Congress Hall is an adjunct of Independence Hall and here located the chambers of the U.S. Senate when Philadelphia was the nation's capital between 1790 and 1800. The vice president's desk and chair were occupied by men later to be presidents, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. Freedom Week, 4th of July week, is celebrated annually on the huge mall. At Washington Square, a similar and equally inspiring observance takes place during Freedom Week. In the shadows of this memorial to Washington is the tomb of an unknown soldier of the American Revolution. While a marine place taps and a wreath is placed on the tomb of the unknown soldier, these youngsters, descendants of revolutionary soldiers, raise special standards of that war, remembering as they do the words on the memorial, freedom is a light for which many men have died in darkness. The house of worship in the background, the renowned Christ Church on 2nd Street, is unique among America's churches. Although designated a national shrine by act of Congress and founded in 1695, it is still in use and supported wholly by its congregation and friends. Inside, Miss Susan Smith of our staff asks Reverend Ernest Harding, rector of the church, about the pew in which they are seated. Well, this pew is known as the George Washington pew. It's the spot in which he and Martha Washington sat while he was here in Philadelphia at the same time that the government was at its capital here in Philadelphia. And they came each Sunday to church and sat in this pew. And of course, before the time of the revolution, it was known as the pew because as you'll see on the column up above, the coat of arms of William and Mary and the royal governor, their governor, sat here for the church services. Of course, there are many older things here in the church than even these pews and the coat of arms. For instance, the baptismal font down in the back of the church that came here in 1697 from All Hallows barking by the tower in London. It was in that font that William Penn was baptized when he was around 20 years old because you know he was a Quaker later in life, but was born an Anglican. And his grandson is buried in the uh, grave uh, just below the wine glass pulpit. The wine glass pulpit was a very famous kind of architecture in uh, the 1700s. 
This one was done by John Falwell. It was given by a Mary Andrews, who's buried in a grave in the back of our center aisle here, and cost 70 pounds. Was the pulpit made here in Philadelphia? It was made here in Philadelphia by Philadelphia craftsmen and designed, as I said, by John Falwell. The Christ Church burial grounds a few blocks away from the church itself is the site of the grave of Benjamin Franklin and of his wife, Deborah. History has happily recorded that Franklin lived to a ripe old age and enjoyed life immensely. He was silent in still life only, for in real life he was a tireless and fluent talker and a man who loved letter writing. Even when he sent a copy of the Constitution to a friend, Franklin couldn't resist adding a few marginal notes. A letter to his wife, visiting in New York, was mailed free. You guessed it, Thrifty Ben was the postmaster. His Poor Richard Almanac is understandably an American classic and presented Franklin at his philosophical best. He that cannot obey, cannot command. An egg today is better than a hen tomorrow. And illustrated proverbs such as, experience keeps a dear school, but fools will learn in no other. When the well is dry, they know the worth of water. And here's a thrifty reminder to it, foolish men make feasts and wise men eat them. Again on thrift, creditors have better memories than debtors. Franklin practiced what he preached. He kept a debtor's book indicating monies owed to him, and while he labeled the ledger small debts, no debt was too small for the ledger. But if we overlook Franklin's passion for thrift, there is a fuller man, a greater man, who has left his mark on a great city and a grateful nation. This enormous statue of Franklin is in the memorial hall of this imposing building, the Franklin Institute, founded in 1824 as a permanent memorial and dedicated to the promotion of the mechanic arts and the dissemination of scientific knowledge. Let's quickly look at some of the fascinating exhibits, such as this display of various types of clock pendulums dating from about the 12th century through the 19th. watch Susan as she approaches the parabolic reflector. But this is tame stuff. Susan is in for a real shock, the Van de Graaff machine that generates static electricity. The Van de Graaff generator separates the positive and negative charges of static electricity. Since you're touching the negative sphere, the negative charge is accumulating in your body. The positive charge and the grounding rod is attracting the negative charge is in your hair. I think if you shake your hair, you'll find that it will stand up and be attracted to this thing quite vigorously. In fact, you should have a mirror and see yourself in this condition. Now, you will notice that when we ground out the machine, the hair will drop down, as now. Now, we can again cause it to rise up again. And if we turn the machine off, of course, the charge will no longer accumulate. Uh, it will be perfectly safe to let go of the machine now. The rolling cone appears to roll uphill. Actually, the center of gravity is lower than the top of the hill and pulls the roller up. I haven't the faintest idea what that means, but that's what they told us. What follows is easier to understand. At least this part is. Just fill the funnel with sand and let the pendulum swing. But hear this. These patterns, called Lisa Zhu figures, are useful in designing or testing electrical circuits, such as those required in your TV set. Well, there's much, much more here at Franklin Institute, inside and out, to spellbind vacationers of all ages. Now, plan on a full day, and honestly, you won't go wrong.
Alfred Sally on 2nd Street north of Arch is literally an 18th century street, not merely because of the stone cobbling, but because its houses are not restorations. They have been in continuous use as residences since colonial times. And speaking of houses, let's satisfy the natural curiosity we all have about the homes of famous people. The flag with 13 stars is enough to tell us that this is the Betsy Ross house, the home and shop of the seamstress who, by all indications, designed the first American flag. This old three-story house is where Edgar Allan Poe lived from 1842 to 44. And it was here that the moody, tormented genius of literature wrote The Raven, The Gold Bug, The Telltale Heart, and other works. It is known that Poe complained bitterly of the high rent, which was $10 per month, unfurnished. In sharp contrast to Poe's humble accommodations is the magnificent home, Mill Grove, near Philadelphia. Once owned by John Penn, title eventually passed on to a young Frenchman in 1804. He left France and came here to take possession of the property, and once through the door of his studio, the pictures on display reveal the Frenchman's identity. For no one before him, no one after him, painted birds and wildlife as he did. The world may never know another John James Audubon. The man is gone, the memories remain. At Millgrove, a sidelight of your visit to some of the elegant homes and mansions on Philadelphia's fashionable Main Line. Now, the Main Line is not a street or avenue. Someone once described it as a series of wealth suburbs linked together by a train. Well, that definition is about as good as any. The commuter train originates at the Philadelphia terminal, and the first important stop is Haverford Station. Now, Haverford is the home of the Marion Cricket Club, the club of the main line. You don't just become a member of Marion, you must practically be born into a membership. They play tennis, doesn't everyone, also squash, badminton, etc. Many national and international tennis matches have been hosted here at Marion. Bryn Mawr is the next stop after Haverford Station, a stop noted mainly for Bryn Mawr College, one of the most highly regarded colleges for women in the country. Our gal Susan was born and raised in the town of Bryn Mawr, where her daddy owned the local hardware store. The Inn of the Four Falls is where the elite meet to eat on the main line. Now, from the parking lot below, you'll be driven to the main entrance in a four-wheeler with a fringe on top. The Four Falls is modeled after an 18th century inn. The main attraction, however, are the four small falls from which the inn derives its name. And these are views from the several dining rooms that make up the inn and overlook the falls. The Devon Horse Show is rated as one of the top mainline social events of the year. The show has been a seasonal highlight for the past 70 years, usually in the last month of May. And among some mainliners, missing the show would be as sinful as skipping baptism. This is the open jump event. The Devon Show runs for a week, and I think that even the committee would agree that you have to be one of the horsey set to understand and truly appreciate all of the events. The judges have more authority than a European monarch. Winners put on a show of humility, while the losers are expected to react as if they had just won the crown jewels. It may seem stuffy, but what a fine education and sportsmanship this is, especially for the younger set at the Devon Horse Show. Paoli is the last stop on the main line, and after that, it's back to the city, perhaps in time for lunch. Da Vinci's is one of the smaller but more popular eating spots in Philadelphia, and during the spring and summer when the weather is just right, 
It's delightful to sit at one of the sidewalk tables and they dream through the extensive menu. You can put on two pounds just reading it while the waiter discreetly serves antipasto, which you agree is precisely what you wanted and how in the world did he know? Well, after lunch, you may decide to walk off a few calories with a stroll through Rittenhouse Square in the heart of the city at Walnut and Chestnut Streets. Rittenhouse is one of several plazas deeded to the city by William Penn. Now, during the vacation season, the square is likely to feature clothesline art exhibits, as they're called here in Philadelphia. All schools and styles of art are generally represented in these clothesline exhibits, and the prices are sharply reduced from what you would pay at the art galleries. The art that is a part of architecture and landscaping is best typified by the Japanese Exhibition House in Fairmount Park. A gift of private citizens in Japan and the U.S. and the New York Museum of Modern Art, it's the most beautiful Japanese setting of its kind that I at least have ever seen anywhere in America. Philadelphia is a port, but not a seaport. Thanks to the Delaware River, which flows into the Atlantic, Philadelphia is the largest freshwater port in the world. Do, and I repeat, do take one of the many fine harbor tours, such as this one aboard the showboat originating from the Chestnut Street Wharf. And what will you see? Well, since the Navy maintains a major yard here, some part of the fleet is almost always in port. Destroyers, battleships, and even aircraft carriers like the mammoth Tarawa. Yes, and an occasional reminder of sailing ships of yesteryear. A rotting hull left here by port officials to appease nostalgic-minded taxpayers. They don't dare remove it. Also in the harbor, you can board one of the most famous ships in American naval history, the Cruiser Olympia, the flagship of Admiral Dewey during the Battle of Manila Bay in 1898. The Olympia is a national shrine and incidentally, the last remaining fleet ship of the Spanish-American War. These metal footprints on the deck mark the very spot where Admiral, then Commodore Dewey, stood when he uttered his classic command, you may fire when you are ready, Gridley. By present day standards, the Olympia is a small ship, but it is a proud ship that added a shining chapter to American naval history. After your harbor cruise, hunger and curiosity will lead you to the old original Bookbinder's Restaurant, established in 1865 by one Samuel Bookbinder. It is to Philadelphia what Antoine's is to New Orleans. Albert Taxon, the son of the present owner, has learned how to hypnotize lobsters. Albert, how? Why? Let's eavesdrop. Well, people come in here and they select lobsters from the lobster tank. In turn, we cook them in the steam kettles. People used to always ask, doesn't it hurt the lobster? when they're put into the steam kettles alive. Actually, they feel no pain. Well, three years ago, an Indian came into the restaurant and he says, I can solve your problem. I said, just exactly how? He said, well, I'll show you how to hypnotize the lobster. Then if anybody asks, you can put them to sleep first. I said, boy, that would be great. In turn, he showed me how to hypnotize the lobster as I am doing now for you. People are amazed now that I can hypnotize lobsters. I'm probably the only hypnotist in the world that can put lobsters to sleep beside this Indian boy. So I'm doing now, you just rub the back. If you can sing, it could even make it easier for me. Now I'm gonna let him stand on his head here. If he's a good boy, he probably can do it. You just rub the nerve on their back. Just rub the nerve on their back. With or without hypnotized lobsters, there is only one bookbinders, and Philadelphians are the first to recommend it. Nightlife in Philadelphia is almost non-existent. The blue sky laws have only recently been modified and never fully repealed. But during the social season, the coming out parties for the city's debutantes are a lavish substitute for what you might expect to see at a nightclub. Our young Deb is Miss Virginia Riddle, 
greeting guests in the reception line with her mother, Mrs. James Riddle, and watching these young adults, 17, 18, 19 years of age, I, for one, was impressed mostly with their poise, the sincere smile, the attractive clothes, and always just the right words of greeting. The setting, by the way, is the Bellevue Stratford Hotel. Some of the parents also showed up, but even so, the party was a smashing success. A happy night in Philadelphia that Virginia Riddle will never forget. The CR Club is one of the city's few nightclubs. Most Philadelphians with a yen for late hours or carousing will cross over into New Jersey. The CR Club generally features a single starring attraction and dancing by the patrons in between floor shows. The Warwick Hotel, they pronounce it Warwick, is the gourmet's meeting place on Thursdays and Sundays when the hotel serves its extraordinary smorgasbord. Now, I'm not a gourmet or a connoisseur of good food, but I've been around these 50 states, and I can't remember a smorgasbord table like it. By the way, the tab is only 550, which may be stiff at home, but on a vacation, you just can't get a better meal for the money. The table always features a gaily decorated cake, and this being Freedom Week, the chef saluted the 4th of July. And what would any celebration in Philadelphia be without the Mummers, the famous string marching band that has become as synonymous with the city as Philadelphia Scrapple? The Mummers on parade in the early hours of a summer eve. vacation is over, and I think we can honestly say that this Philadelphia, really two cities in one, is quite a place. It took us six weeks to photograph what you have seen during the past 30 minutes, but as a sightseer, you can cover the same ground, see and do the same things in a week or ten days at most. Best of all, I think Philadelphia is an excellent choice for a family vacation blending as it does the charm of the historic past with the loveliness of the changing present. Two for the price of one, the two magnificent Philadelphias. <laughs>